Hooray, we've got another day to work on the old bush machine. It's been sitting here for weeks uh, with a broken chain and so I got a couple of wheels off trying to work on that and in the meantime I got some great news. Um, sometimes you get a hold of one of these old machines and you just don't really know how they work and then you stumble across a guy that has a manual that's willing to send it to you and that helps a ton and then it gets even better because I got a random email from a feller and normally I don't respond to people I don't know but this time I just decided to because he suggested he had some input on these machines knew a little bit about them and get this let's just take a look at something here if we look down here at, at the manufacturer's tag, it's made by E.H. Summers. Well, I get an email from a guy named Eric Summers. And he turns out to be the E in E.H. Summers. So, how about that? Still operating a business, I think a computer business now up in North Bay. Out of the same building, this machine was built in. So boy oh boy talk about getting good input good solid input how about getting information from the guy that actually built these you know the guy that actually had the company that manufactured these in the 70s so I mean there's really nothing I can't find out now I'm gonna learn everything um, I got a little input about this paint job and this steering which is I think different than any others all right while my lovely partner's inside uh, whipping up a little breakfast, um, I'll just uh, fill you in on another thing I got going on here. Um, okay, so I, I was quick talking about that uh, it, that steering system. Turns out it's it's out of an Odyssey, a Honda Odyssey, back from the 70s. They they were using that kind of airplane looking wheel, and uh, Mr. Summers told me that that was a dealer in Sudbury had customize this machine. I'm not sure if it was for his own purposes or if it was to sail, sell this way, but he put on an Odyssey wheel, he put on those boat seats, and he did the camel paint job on the hood. Uh, so uh, I'm waiting for a little bit of input also from the guy I bought it from, because he was into Honda Odyssey, so there's maybe some suggestion that uh, he put on the Odyssey wheel himself from a parts machine, but we're learning lots of things and then also <laughs> in the meantime just like three days ago I got another random email from a fella that has information on bush machines so I've never seen any of these in my life I go look online there's almost no information now I'm finding all the best people to get information from on these machines so what he has, and, and, and get this, um, the name I think, I just read the name and you know I've, I've got other things in my mind so I wasn't really paying attention and for some reason I'm pretty sure the last name was a French name and, and I thought well maybe this is a fellow that had contacted me before or a fellow that had contacted, a fellow that I had contacted before. For some reason I thought he was in Quebec and <laughs> so he said he had parts and I showed me some pictures, I'll pop those up right now. And I thought, hey, I would love to have an original gas tank. I'm, I'm about to um, modify a fuel cell that I got online and make it fit. Yeah, I don't know how much shipping costs, but I'd love to buy that fuel tank off you, the aluminum fuel tank. I think you're in Quebec, right? And then a, a day went by, and then I finally get a reply. And he says, nope, not Quebec. I'm in London, Ontario. <laughs> so, so am I. So what are the odds of that? I've never seen any of these before. Now it turns out there's two more in my city. So that's going to be an easy, uh, that's going to be an easy visit to make. I'm going to run over, check out, he's got a Bush machine. I'll check out the serial number on it. Uh, mine is number 177, I think it was. Uh, Mr. Summers explained to me that there was 140 of these made, I believe, in North Bay. Uh, the Bush machine, uh, the, the Bush Swamper came after when um, the other company bought the rights to it or the manufacturing was moved. I'm going to get more information on that too. Uh, I'm going to send a list of questions and I'm going to probably annoy a lot of people with my, <laughs> with my inquiries. But hey, 
I want to know everything about them because I'm really, uh, I'm really into it now and we want to use this thing a lot and uh, I want to know all about how to repair it and how to maintain it because to be honest with you, when I bought it, when I looked at it online, I thought it was just going to be another one of those 70s toys. Uh, so many amphibious multi-wheel vehicles were made in the late 60s, early 70s that came and went. They basically started building all these things and then they all went out of business. Except for a couple, for example, Argo stayed in business. But most of them didn't and most things in general in the 70s kind of were flash in the pan like hovercrafts and things like that that people were building. So I thought this was just going to be another gimmicky thing and I've had bad luck building late 60s amphibious vehicles like the Rough Rider I had. I bought it in really good shape. Turns out I needed a motor and I found a motor, actually a better motor, 292cc I think it was. And um, once I actually spent all this time putting it back together and running it, I realized what a piece of crap. <laughs> it was just, I mean, it was, it's a novelty. All right. It would go scooting across the field, bouncing around on those flotation tires they had, those old original flotation tires that you can't find anymore. People hoard them that, that need them. They just have their shed full of these flotation tires. But um, I discovered that the steering control was ridiculous. You know, when you're on the throttle, and you'd steer, it would tend to go the way you wanted to, but if you let off the throttle, it would like jump back the other way because of the way the resistance was in the drivetrain. It was nonsense. But I'm now realizing this is not nonsense. This is a serious machine for doing serious things in serious places. And uh, we're up to the task of testing out its capabilities big time. Um, I think I started telling you one correction I was going to make before the other camera went down. I thought the manufacturer of this machine died in a plane crash and, and like I say information from people you know, you, it, it, they try to be accurate and, and it's great getting information from everybody but sometimes someone else comes along and, and updates that information or helps and so I pass that on to the other guy and say oh just so you know I got, I got this bit of information too so you know and in this case <laughs> I thought the manufacturer of this machine was killed in a plane crash so when I got an email from him it was a little spooky <laughs> you know I, I, eventually I mentioned um, I was informed that um, <laughs> the manufacturer passed away in a plane crash says no what it was was the dealer in Sudbury that sold these and customized it you know the seats the paint job and stuff um, he's the one that died in the plane crash so it was his own plane, a bush plane or something like that, I'm not sure. You know, northern Ontario, um, there's not a lot of places to land if you got problems. It's, you're just going in the bush. So uh, I'll get more information on that. But And I also don't know if this was just a machine he was selling, you know, as a dealer, or if this is his own personal machine. Just the fact that it's, you know, got this custom paint job on it, it seems to me that it might have been his, his personal machine. Um, but I'll find out. So I'm trying to figure out how I got from Sudbury down to London. Uh, I, I got a line now into the, pre the previous owner that I bought it from. I, I'd forgotten that a member of the family knows him. <laughs> so uh, I said, okay, well, get a line to him. I'm looking for some information. You know, give him my number. So I'm slowly putting this together. In the meantime, this fellow right here in London has a bush machine like mine. Mine's 177. The serial numbers started at a hundred um, because the manufacturer Mr. Summers explained to me that because of all the prototypes that happened uh, in the 70s well by the time they're ready to manufacture they just started serial numbers at 100 makes sense so me being 177 it's the 77th machine of 140 built okay so the original Bush machines only 140 were built North Bay then they went over to Sudbury, uh, I think it was Bristol Manufacturing, um, I'm very, pretty sure it was. I think they make other things, farm equipment or something. But then all well into the 90s, they built the Bush Swamper with a lot of upgrades, modifications, flat floor, dashboard with, you know, 
controls on the dash and stuff. Um, they really refined the machine. I kind of prefer the fact that I got one of the old originals, so it just seems a little more, I don't know, like a machinist built it, you know what I mean? It's, I, I don't like them all refined. I like you know, seeing the engine right in front of you and seeing the brakes and the clutches work right in front of you. Uh, I think that's neat. Right now, I'm all set to, uh, it was also explained to me, you know, because I got a broken chain and I run over to TSC and buy a new master link and of course the master link comes with a little key, you know, that goes on the outside of the link. Um, I kind of hinted a little bit to him to explain that I'm not sure if I should really be using a master link. Maybe it should be peened on, which I've never done before. Master links are really simple. And I got the reply back that no, don't use the master link. Clearances are tight in there. That link can be popped off and there goes your day. So and maybe that's actually what happened to this. I don't know. Maybe I should be running a magnet in there looking for a little master link in there. Ready? All right, let's move it. Should move pretty easily. Spin it to the nose, the nose is up to the bike there. Now right under the chain. Okay, one thing we've learned, we've learned a few things about how, how these this axle system works with the double wheels on it. Now, the the wheels are actually welded together. There's a tube that welds the two or welded the two rims together. So I was always wondering how the heck you can possibly have any strength to this axle system with a five inch tub underneath. What what is holding that in place that's going to be strong enough to handle the bush? Well, what I discovered was cruise along in here, these axles are hollow. And then, you know, when it goes into the tub, there's of course another one on the other side. And inside of this tube is another axle, like another round solid bar that also goes into the far side tube on the other side. All right, so what it is is there's one inside these. These can rotate independently over top of it, but uh, I, I'm not gonna take this apart this time and see how that works, but I just saw it in the manual and it's pretty rough looking manual, very hard to read, but uh, I was able to understand that there's a tube inside two tubes that get mounted down with uh, their corresponding, I don't know where I put it, oh yeah, with these great big bushings and that's, and then they're clamped tight with about a million bolts to the aluminum tub and that's how it, uh, and that's how it provides the strength for this thing and it looks like it works. All right, so let's see what we can do. I was going to put a master link on this chain. I got uh, I got the chain here out that was broken, and then I bought a new master link to put on. But I was advised by the manufacturer not to do that, to actually peen the link so that each link will be like that, like an original one. No key on the master link. I believe it has to do with the tolerances in here. The chain goes around this sprocket and that. Probably can't see, but I'll try. And uh, a key on a master link could catch something. Could catch something else and, and, and flick the, the key off. And that would be the end of your day. So I'm going to learn how to peen a chain now. <laughs> It's not going to be easy in here. It says you put a block on the other side of the tub and hammer it in place. Well, 
<laughs> I don't see how that's going to be possible, but maybe when I get the front wheel off, it can be done when it's on the sprocket up there. I don't think it's going to be easy on this, you know, second row back axle. I think it has to be down the front. So I'm going to put the camera down and get to work and see what we can do. So time to get your hands dirty. Take a look at this. Okay, so these plates that hold the axle, and I'll just show you against this one, even though this obviously isn't the right one. Um, it's very specific. The the corner bolts that I was having troubles with when I took this apart, uh, I was informed by um, the fellow friend of mine that lives up in Timmins that was giving me help. He's the fellow that sent me the manual. He says very specific where these corner bolts are drilled on the tub okay so all these other ones these I think these are called cap screws and these corner ones that have a, I'll show you okay so the corner bolts have a taper and are machined in a very specific place in the plate and on the tub they can't be interchanged around the machine it has to be these fix it in place that's why the taper so it's you know, sucks it in right into the proper spot. And then the rest of them are just bolts. I think they're called cap screws. And they don't locate anything. All they do is tighten everything down all the way around. So I see this corner has three of the tapered ones. I don't know if the other one does. No. Unless someone has done this, someone may have done this afterwards. They, I don't know why they would. I think the factory would have done that. This one only has the tapers on the corners. Okay, four places, and then it gets tightened down in its specific spot. So the distance between the axles is very specific on this machine. So once these four corners get tightened in, then the rest can go. I have a manual that shows the torque. Um, I'm going to guess 70 pounds, but don't quote me until I take a picture of the manual, which I have over there. And, um, and we also use blue Loctite. Now the manual describes using Loctite all the way around. Um, I have sealant I'm going to use. I, at first I said I wasn't going to use any sealant. I just want to use, you know, spray on some um, Mr. Gasket. But I'm going to have to go with the manual on this one and put a layer of sealant all the way around. Bolt it back on. And it should never leak. But first we got to work on this chain. Nice. Everybody's learning so much. And I think I might have mentioned once that these axles were solid, but they're not. They're, they're, they're hollow. They're pretty tough stuff, but they are hollow to take the inner, inner tube, <laughs> the inner tube that gives it strength from side to side. All right. So I'm going to bring this one with the cotter pin up and around so we can see it better. Can you see that in the screen now? Wow, is there some good light on that? Really, and it's funny because a cotter pin went through it and then has been smashed. But I'm not so sure that's done with a hammer. That that could be hitting something in here. I mean, this chain is right up against the tub now, probably because I yeah, because it's not tightened in. But if this was tightened into position, that chain is still going to be ultra tight to the sidewall, and that's why the boss that made this said, "Don't use a key. Don't use a." You know, don't use a clip. Peen the, the link. Because it could catch the edge of something in there and throw that clip off. And then you're done. 
rest of the chain breaks, and you're done. And I said, you just spin this around. And then I'm going to have to work up here. I'm going to grind this all off up here because this mount for the adjuster, uh, this shaft will move when you tighten it in here, and, and we'll you know tighten up this jack shaft chain. Um, I don't think I can. Maybe I can put like a, a scope in there and take a look. <laughs> Not really sure what we're looking at though. So if I follow this chain up, there's a sprocket up there. Oh. But I have to loosen that up and see what we can do. And also, this is probably going to be more forward to pull, pull the chain tight. So, all right, I get the gist of it. Once the axle is bolted back on in its place with thread locker and the corners properly located, the axle will be fairly, you know, the chain will be fairly tight. And then you go up here to the jack shaft adjuster, turn on. I'm going to have to build one, but. That's just I'm going to have to get the welder out for the first time since buying it and figure that out. Oh, the link's off. This might not go through. Bonk. Okay. All right. Now we got us a perfectly good chain to work with. I think, yeah. So there's the broken bits. Yeah, that one there was the bad one. It broke. There it goes. So what I just did there was you can see inside of the hole there, maybe a bit too much shade there we go there's like a little barrel or tube that goes inside the link edge well it had shifted right through and out the other side so now I've just pressed everything back together and it's in uh, in its proper place so now when we put the new one in and see it should just slide right on through and it does and then we put the plate on the other side you know with the other end of the chain on That'll leave us enough, I believe, to hit with a hammer and smash that pin down like all the other ones are smashed flush there. So I've got some bright lights on the situation now and I want to show, I'm going to have to zoom because I can't move the camera any closer. This half link that was in the front axle chain with a cotter pin holding it in place. But I want to cut that cotter pin out of there just get rid of it and just peen the rest of that pin the way all these factory ones are done. Ideally I'd like to just tear all the chains out of this thing and put all new chains in because I really don't know what's been done over the years but uh, we want to get this thing rolling on down the road so for now we'll fix her up as we see things There we go. Oop. Fell in. It fell in. So, this is where you get a magnet <laughs> and start fishing. <laughs> Alright, let's see if I can find that. Fishing. Yeah. It slid way back in there. Who knows? Maybe it's still up in here. Everything in there is made of metal, so it just finds every other thing. Probably a good idea to fish around in here with a magnet anyway, just in case there's some. There it is. Okay, so there's the pin. Not sure what we're looking at there. Well, I think uh, I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to um, go back to the way it was and put a new cotter pin in this and, and not peen it. Um, the nice thing is, is this one's on the outside and if I need to peen it after, if, if someone chimes in there I get better information. I just have to pull this cover off and take a hammer to it, but I, I have to figure out a way to get a better block of metal in behind it and, and I'm thinking maybe 
maybe that's why this half link is using a cotter pin is because there's no practical way to do that unless you have you know, a specific dimension piece of metal that will fit back in there so this is how it's going to go back together because this is how I found it and but first I'm going to put uh, the new chain link um, in the back the new drive chain in it because now this one's kind of out of the way I, I, I can get to things and then I, I'll have to figure out how to put this one back on probably not too hard it's all right there in front of me so let's have at her I knew this was going to be a tough job this ain't no Argo okay folks here's something very interesting and helpful it just took me forever to figure it out um, trying to mess with this chain situation with the axle in place at this point is ridiculous so what I've discovered is if I take off the jack shaft chain the number 60 jack shaft chain there's number 50 transmission chain in there too I'll, I'll uh, okay so up on the transmission on each side is a number 50 chain that comes down to this jack shaft chain one on each side to this sprocket I should say from this sprocket number 60 chain the same as all the other chain runs down to the front axle on the outside here well trying to work this out and figure out how to get this other chain back in there to put the master link and everything that runs to you know goes here and there is just impossible there's no room in these holes so what I discovered if I disconnect the jack shaft chain and just let it hang on its sprocket in there um, so you can, I don't know if you can see, probably not, but in the back hole you can see a bit of that. All of a sudden, with both chains off, watch this, <laughs> the whole axle comes out. <laughs> the whole axle comes out, yeah, and it's, it's, it's losing grease, so I'm going to put it back on and go get a pan. Now we can see how this whole machine works. You just slide off the axle and then you see the interior axle which is full of gross I mean just this is this needs to be changed big oh and there's water inside the axle and all kinds of different goops take a look down here yeah take a look at that gross stuff down there eh? I'll just set this here and let it drain out too so this is the t piece of pipe or tube that goes inside each axle on the other side. On this side and that side, it joins the two. But free wheels inside them. This is just for strength, just for support. So now I can pull it right out and all the goop can go. That's hollow, yep. All the goop can go right down into the bin. Bunch of water, different things going out of there, coming out of there. That is, uh, yeah. So now I know how this machine works, <laughs> and you do too. Now it's wide open in there, and you can get a whole arm and hand up in there and fish chains around and do all kinds of things. But I'm going to be cleaning this all out now. Guess what? what? We're all good. We're all good. I've got this whole machine figured out. You do, do you? Yep. Alright, tell me all about it. Okay. Oh, God. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's not fair. It's all. <laughs> it's all part of learning. Now I got grease all over the camera. Okay, well, let's just for fun run this new chain in there and see what happens with it. So it's going to feed down, it's going to come, there's a, there's a uh, idler sprocket on this shaft that's going to go up and over and then down under this axle sprocket and then all the way back to, its, uh, to where it started. Yeah, there's probably a much easier way, if I would just read the instructions I would know, but <clears throat> they're in the house and I don't have time, so if I just put it in like that and then just sort of let it let it run, maybe I can grab it at the other end. Maybe. Maybe not. And then pull it back. 
Oh, pulled the wrong bit. But... Oh, that bit just fell off. You know what I'm going to do is stop right now and put this chain up here better. And, you know, like that. Oh, alright, maybe not like that. Because now how am I going to hold it from falling off of that? Maybe put some vice grips to her, maybe just these pliers. We'll maybe work for now. Just sort of tip them in there like that, All right? Not a bad idea. Okay. Where was I? Oh, there's a chain right there. So it's got to go, because luckily I left the chain on the other side. I can just use it as a guide. So it's got to go over top of the idler. Don't really need to see everything. You'll get the gist of it when I, you know, if you look around at the different parts here, different parts of the video. Kind of had a feeling when they designed and built these things. Uh, you know, they, they were just ecstatic that they got everything to work. Uh, but the fact that someone else is going to have to figure it out <laughs> maybe wasn't a priority. But once you do figure it out, it's 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 like your own personal machine now, eh? It's you understand it. You understand the guys that were building it. They were far, I think, far more at the time anyway, far more advanced than the Argo guys or anybody else doing amphibious AATVs. This is no simple machine. This is no light duty machine. This isn't for your family outing on the weekend. This thing's built to work and make money. Get you through the swamp. It's not built for a lot of people to be on, and that's just fine because unlike other machines where you sit inside like a tub and all the weight's low, this one you're sitting up top. You're like sitting on it like it's a cork, like you're sitting on top of a cork. So you got to use your sensibilities with this one, or you're just going to tip it over, especially in the water. You know, the engine's high, the people are high, everything's sitting up high. So. Right, the chain is in there, in its right spot. Okay, I've got the components here for the front axle on the right side all cleaned up in the parts tank. And uh, of course, this is the outer axle that you would actually mount the wheels to. And it's it's a little bit, got some surface rust on it. I'll, I'll polish that up, but it looks like the bearing surfaces um, are, are a little scored. I uh, might um, try to think what I'm going to do about that. Maybe nothing because you know the bushing that they fit into is in really good shape. There's lots of material on there. I'd imagine that at some point this brass bushing wears to a point where you know the axle's sloppy in there and then the o-ring that seats in here just a rubber o-ring just can't seal it anymore and you start just leaking um, oil out of the tub like crazy. At that point I think these plates would have to go into a machine shop to have a new piece of brass um, pressed in place. The exact inside diameter, I mean the machining tolerances, I don't know. That's what I'd have to find out. You know, I, I have um, Eric Summers watching these videos, I'm pretty sure. And I bet you he'll know. I bet you he'll be able to tell me the exact dimensions of these brass bushings. So that in the future, when I run to a machine shop, they can just press the proper piece in there for me. And maybe I might have to go, hmm, oh, yeah, see, if I had to go oversize on this because the axle's worn down some, i got to have the entire axle tube turned down a little bit because this has to slide on from the end all the way in. So if they put an oversized piece of brass in there, then the whole axle has to be down a little bit. I'm, I'm sure enough was designed into uh, these tubes that that can be done at least once. You know, turn them down and uh, you know, it'd be almost nothing. Now, and then of course you probably saw this internal, internal piece. This is the piece that joins left side to right side and adds or creates basically the strength of each set of axles. So again, 
brass bushings, one in each end, that would fit. Let's just uh, do an overhead shot here, kind of. So it would fit inside the axle tube there up until that boss. And then, you know, rides inside the axle tube. It looks like about halfway, about halfway down that axle tube. It, it rides on that brass bushing inside there. And then, of course, the same happens on the other end. And this is just freewheeling in there. There's no sprockets, nothing bolts it to anything. It just goes, it just goes right inside the axle all the way in until it gets to this boss and slides in and that's just how she sits so it's probably into the axle to about here now it's providing strength all the way across and out onto the other one sorry too far on the other axle and this is just going to spin inside all lubed up because this is all inside the tub which is full of oil. This is the aluminum tub and uh, it's it's full of oil about halfway so you can see this axle here would have wheels on it so you can see about halfway up that axle that tub would be full of oil so up to about there and then of course it's going to seep oil into the bushings and when I reassemble this I'm going to oil them down real good so they got you know and I just grinding metal on metal when, uh, until the oil does make its way down the length of this tube and these sprockets are definitely not meant to ever come back off I think these are in such good shape that I just I just don't even need to worry about that I don't think in my lifetime of owning this machine I'm going to have to replace any of this stuff I just don't I think there's I, again I don't know what the dimensions of this of these brass collars would be when they're pressed on oh but yeah I want to find out why this one is pressed on but you know sticks out past the tube whereas at the other end it doesn't in fact it's pressed on a little further than the tube you know, here's a little little brass hammer it is moving Thing. Maybe not. Yeah, it's moving. Oops, sorry about the camera. I wasn't paying attention. But yeah, it's. I bunted it back up flush with the tube. But I honestly don't think it's going to work itself off. This one, you know, sliding inward. Uh, I'm not going to work. I mean, I could maybe. No, I'm not even. I was going to say I could drop this in the vise and and just tap, you know, the steel tube. And but you know what? It's such a minor, minor amount. It's not quite flush. Forget it. Uh, I would think the center one's more important. Let's measure that and make sure it's in the middle. Okay, nine and a half minus a sixteenth. Okay, uh, nine and a half plus a 32nd so I say that's good enough no way is that going to concern me that's certainly not going to compromise the structural integrity of the front axle but when I rebuild this machine I'll make it all the math perfect and then again this is not a per part I want to replace or have made I bet you I bet you that's kind of expensive what am I going to do now There's the innards. You can see the other axle is weeping its goop out from inside of it. Now, I was thinking about maybe dragging something in there to just pull all the goop out of there, but you know what? You got to know every single one of these other ones is like that, and this is not a complete teardown. This will be a teardown. This will be a total teardown next year. Now that I know how everything works, I'm going to be more prepared. I'm going to have, and, and you know what? I'm going to see what problems I might run into over the summer too. So I'll be more prepared when I do the rebuild. All right. So I just got some, <laughs> just some oil from my truck. It's, I don't think it's very specific what's required. Just as long as it's slippery and these lights are driving me bananas. But So if you don't see it, if I don't have the camera pointed right way, I'm going to drop oil all over these brass bushings 
each end and then I'm going to slide it back into the other tube and then I'm going to throw the axle in on this side over top of that and I got my bucket of gunky oil so I'll just pour over that and then there we go and you know, before I turn one foot on this machine it's going to be full oil the whole tub will be full so all these things are going to be encased in oil as soon as it starts turning it's going to it's going to pull the oil in all right so you didn't miss much when i had this other frame but just oiling up the bushings so that's all good and safe all right slide that guy in there all the way to the other end and oh man there is no slop at all i'd swear these things like this has no miles on it or something i don't know you would think there'd be a little bit of motion in the, in the bushing, but there is nothing. Got to go get the axle. Let's see if we just slide this guy on. This rocket's in. Now I see already I'm going to have a pro. Oh, no, it's going to slide underneath this chain I put up there temporarily. And, well, maybe not because I got to lift it a little bit to, to get it in to the tub. So I'm going to have to pull this little system out for a minute anyway. And, um, yeah, just drop, it. well, I might have to drop it inside. Maybe you have to give it a little bit of a, there you go, center it. That's all you need to do. Now, this is going to be tricky because, um, I mean, how am I going to, I guess what I can maybe do is, is roll the chain up from the bottom onto its internal sprocket there. Okay, so this link has to go to this link. So that's got to go. I got to have quite a bit of space between those. I don't. Oh, hell no. That's not even close. So now what do I do? Oh, well, okay. Well, now my. <laughs> I got to think. This is not. Not. Not going to happen. There it goes. Okay, you can see maybe <laughs> you can see the chain rolling over the top there you're not gonna be able to see it but what I'm doing now is um, I've rolled it so far over that it's gonna be beside the chain beside it again like from the other side but this side's gonna be so much looser that it'll hang down below the other chain even though Oh, maybe. Oh, you know what? Because the adjuster's out on both sides, I can lift the chain on the other side and drop the chain on this side, get the pin in, and then carry on with my life. There it started. Push it on. There we go. So now if I roll this wheel back up, you'll see, well, you can probably see in the light there now that the pins are through both, both sides. I'll tell you, putting a... Putting on a key, um, a clip, would be so much easier, man. I know what they're saying, the tolerances are tight and it can hit against the chain on this side when it's on and just peel that clip off. Oh, but those sprockets, oh man, I know, I see what you're saying. If you roll this and this chain comes up and catches that clip, or even worse, where this chain is coming down, and catches that clip on the back it's going to be mouth open it's going to grab it and knock it off and you want it open because you don't want this chain to be rolling around with the with the you know the teeth this way or it's going to catch something on the bottom and knock it off i i see exactly why it needs to be peened on i just don't know how to do it at this point here's what i got to peen and it's in a position right now where i could so the manual says to put um, a blocker behind the link you're going to peen over to the tub on the other side and then you can hammer on it but I couldn't figure out really a way to put like a, just a nice big square block in there because the chains on the other side are in the way so what I did is I went to my parts bin and got this big old bolt and um, I think if I put the, the wide face against the other side hopefully that won't do any damage so this will be the inside of the other side 
It's pretty thick aluminum. I suspect that's going to be strong enough to take a hammer blow. We'll find out, but it fits in there all right. If I slide it in between all the other chains, I can get it. I can get it behind the pin and just push the axle and it holds it in place. I think. I think that's peened. I don't think I need this on here anymore. I'll get rid of that. I'll put the other chain on. Oh, how am I going to do this? And it's hot in there, probably. Uh oh, I can't find the other chain. Look at that. Hair in there. Suggested using a magnet to draw the chain forward. And darn it if that didn't work. Believe it or not, she's not a mechanical engineer. Should hang on to it there. Now I can't see in there probably to find the other bit. Magnet. Okay, so what I've got here is uh, I've got the chains back in. So the inner chain here, the one on the outside, you can see is the jack shaft chain. And then the one next to it inside the tub is runs to the next axle in line. Back there, we'll call it number two axle. They're all in. And I've pinned the link on the axle chain, but I didn't do that on the jack shaft chain. I put in a link, I mean, that was already in it. And it had a little cotter pin holding it like you saw earlier. So I put a new cotter pin in. And I'm just going to hope it holds. And if it doesn't, well, that's going to be a thing, trying to get this thing back home from wherever I am, if that chain gives way. What I'm going to do eventually, I think I told you already, I'm going to tear this whole thing out and put all new chains and links and do everything really nice, because I really don't know what's going on in here. There, as far as I know, there's shards of metal in this tub that are just waiting to be picked up. Now that I got these axles back together, uh, temporarily, I'm going to... Um, I, I got to get new O-rings, O-rings that, that fit in there to seal the axles. I don't want to use the old ones. And um, what else? Oh yeah, and I wanted to get um, new locating screws for the mounting plates there. So I'm gonna go get new hardware there. I already have I have Loctite, and I have maybe I better get some more a tube of um, a tube of sealant to put on those plates before I put them back on. And oh yeah, and a big job I'm going to have next is going to be to make a adjusting uh, plate for the jack shaft. Okay, I think I've had a successful chain repair. <laughs> all right, I in no way am going to be able to run this thing until I get all of these adjusters correct. All right, all these chain tensioners tensioners proper. That, I'm quite certain, is what caused my problem in the first place. And none of these things were adjusted right, and uh, yeah, it, it failed large. And changing a chain on this, yeah, there's, you know, I, I should, really should have read the manual first, day eh, because it, it did describe some things I should have done, like how about peening the link, like one of them, out of the machine. Uh, I hear I peened them both in the machine, and it was a bugger. I had to you know, I had to heat them to, to make them pliable enough to hammer and I was just, you know, I was just praying I wouldn't, you know, punch a hole through the aluminum on the other side because of the, the bolt I was using to, as a backer, to, for peening. So peening was not easy. It's a small hole to get your hammer through there and in my hands up in there too, holding the, the backer bolt. And, you know, I did hit my thumb one time and, and then I wasn't happy about that. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's doable. It's doable. Let's just leave it at that. All right, folks, um, I'm going to run in and get some dinner. Uh, Karen's already run in to get stuff ready, and, uh, you know, uh, she's a good help today. 
Uh, she's really inquisitive and she's keeping an eye on this thing and by the time we get this done she's going to know everything I did and how I did it and uh, she'll be my backup plan if I forget how I went ahead and did something. So for now, cheers from Ontario. Have a good one. Take care, eh?